Products to go on to global judging to compete with the other, you know, 160 plus uh, products that we picked. Um, but what we asked them to consider was how well did the solution embody the challenge presented? Uh, how much of an impact will it have on the world? And how complete was the solution they created? Um, you know, we're here to solve real problems, so we want to we want to see as much work as done as possible and give a good foundation for further work to happen in the future. Um, so we've also kind of made that like this higher consideration. Like if, if we have two really awesome challenges and they, they really embody the challenge and they really will change the world, um, which one is a little bit further along, that'll be the tiebreaker. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our judges. Um, on the extreme left, we have David Hockman. Um, thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, David was actually a judge for last year's Space Apps Challenge as well, so we'd like to welcome him back and say thank you again. Um, David is a consultant in tech-based development. Uh, he's also a chairman of the New, chairman of the New York Business Incubation Association and was a software entrepreneur in, in the 80s. Uh, we also have Jen Stead of the office. <laughs> Jen, Jen is from NASA. She's with the office of the Chief Technology uh, Special. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> technologist. Teacher, chief technologist. Okay. Um, and uh, she she actually came all the way up here from, from Philadelphia. DC. DC. Washington DC. She was so excited when she got here uh, early in the morning on Saturday that she was just like blown away by all the wonderful work that was happening. And she said we weren't expecting anyone to come until the evening, but she was here all day being an inspiration and, and chatting with everyone and answering questions, actual technical questions that people had. So thank you so much. Man. Um, and last but not least, and very much not least, uh, Ron Guerin. Uh, Ron is an NASA astronaut. I, he's at, at AstroRon on Twitter. I don't think I need to say too much more. If it, you know, no more uh, introduction there. Um, Ron did a wonderful uh, presentation for our kickoff party. Um, we actually made that available on YouTube. Uh, so he's, uh, his presentation was very inspiring. I felt very inspired by it, and I think everyone else who attended uh, did as well. And I really thought that was a great launch to our entire competition. So um, let's get to the first presentation. Uh, we have uh, space races, and they will be uh, the, they will be embodying the challenge of uh, reach for the stars. Yes, okay. I don't have a list in front of me. I'm going to have a short look. Uh, on deck, we have. Uh, Oh, my space cow. My space cow. Gotcha. Space cow, NYC, and my space cow. So, uh, space race is on over. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt, um, and I'm proud to launch the, uh, the demos for, for Space Apps New York. Uh, we are happy to present to you today Space Races. One of the challenges that's being faced is getting kids excited about science, technology, engineering, and math fields. And um, this is a pretty telling quote from a couple years ago. Um, basically saying that right now, we really aren't leveraging technology in the way that we could, or to really make sure that our kids are getting excited about these fields. Um, there's just a ubiquitous presence of technology that we can utilize now. Um, and in particular, NASA is, is trying to create more interactive games to get kids involved in STEM. And that's not just fourth graders, but all the way up to high school kids. Um, unfortunately, because of recent budget cuts uh, at the federal level, um, this can become a bit of a threat. So we were really tasked with an idea of, well, how do we make a, a solution for this um, that can be open source, accessible, and, and also gets kids really excited about, about space. And that's what we're here for. So Space Race is taking kids on a journey that NASA experts every single day uh, get to experience. Um, they get, get to take a mission from scratch and basically create it themselves uh, to the point where they can see an admission become a success. So, uh, Sumi is going to show us the demo, and you can see this is all a web based app um, with some really, really cool uh, graphics on it. And basically, what we do is um, kids can start out by choosing what type of delivery vehicle they want to use. So, we'll pick a medium launch vehicle. It's got sounds. Um, and then we say, well, what do we want to take it? Do we want to go to deep space? Do we want to go use the rover? So, we're going to go to deep space. Then we decide, well, what kind of propulsion are we going to use? Are we going to make it uh, like a nuclear-based propulsion system for our payload? Is it going to be more traditional or ion propulsion? And you can pick one there, so we're going to choose combustion. Then we decide whether that's going to be manned on 
And um, we also, by the way, can use speak motion to, to highlight this. So we will choose a minute mission. And then what happens at the end is um, basically after that's completed, a video shows up showing a sample mission that NASA has already completed or will be completing in the future. So this shows kids that you've been able to successfully pick all the objects that will allow a mission to succeed. Um, so you can see that it's, it's incorporating what NASA has already designed, um, live animatronics, and we can obviously we can, uh, tailor this to every single mission and build a database of missions that are available. Um, now this is only the first step. So if you look at what, uh, if you go back to the pitch, um, so if you look right now, we're at version one, which is our current state. But then we've, we've already developed a product roadmap. What we want with version two is a choose your own adventure sort of element, where we can actually see whether or not kids are a success or a failure based on the mission they want to complete, um, and whether or not they pick the right things to do it. And then version three is going to be more complex, where kids can start looking at launch trajectories and launch windows. Things that are much more particular to a mission. Okay. These are the tech we used a lot. Thank you very much. Um, and then our team has been awesome. Surprisingly enough, I'm the only like former rocket scientist on the team, and everyone else on the team has been true rock stars. So it's just a joy to work with them for the past few days. Um, but also, we want to continue working on this as a team. We have 15 independent developers who want to continue working on this project open source with NASA. So we're very, very excited to work forward with it. That's it. Thank you. Is there a way to um, indicate up front 
with the dots or with the text whether there's a picture uh, that exists or not? Um, we don't currently have that in the session because it puts just a uh, piece of information into a document. The minus which challenge is this? Is? This is the MySpace Pal challenge. Um, did you code it so that it's nice on mobile, or is it mostly for uh, web based on computer? It is responsive. In the time available that we had, we didn't entirely optimize it for mobile, but this is all responsive, so I'm using it for Windows What would be the next step from the point that you're at now forward? Um, so we want to. Um, well, it's an entirely functioning prototype, <laughs> so it's actually really solid. Um, I'm an astrophysicist. I'm going to go into work on Monday and I'm going to tell all my astrophysical friends to use this because this is a great way of figuring out not just what's being looked at, but it means we can actually search on any object in the sky and bring back every telescope, every date that's existed in that before. As far as I'm aware, that's, there is no single source for that information. So from a functional point of view, this is exactly what I need. Pass the microphone back and forth during Q and A, um, and keep the mic a little bit closer to your mouth just so that everyone can hear you, and we can get you on the live stream. Uh, so next up, we have pipe by pipe, uh, embodying the M water predicting water contamination challenge. So we had to convert that over to uh, GeoJSON, and that did take a while. But as you see here, we have more precise information. Um, each of the blue dots are water supplies, which are provided by M, M Water, and the green, the dark green, is census data. So with the app, we can build a pipe, so that the user can click on one place, and it'll say start building pipe, and another one. And you built a pipe of 218 kilometers. With that, we can provide to the, cut to the end user um, just some, some sample on how much that would cost. And that's it. Thank you. Site, 
people look, you know, identifying locally what their needs are and, and us sort of responding to that with, 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 the, with the project. I was a little confused at where the initial data for the good water versus the bad water comes from. How does that get fed into the app? Yeah, um, so the, the MWater app allows people to record water quality tests on their own. Like we use low cost water quality tests. So um, what, what we could do is use the app to just map the pipe supply network. You know, that would be you know, one way, because we assume the pipe water is generally clean. Um, but we can also, you know, from the app, we, we collect data on other sources, and we do water tests, and we can find out you know, how much more improved is, is the, um, the pipe solution versus what, else, you know, what people are using that. Yeah, that would be the next step, um, and we'll be there this summer. We'll be getting hopefully they have GIS data that has like the whole network. We'd love to like bring that in using the, the technology they put together here, and, and it'll display on that. Uh, I did not envy our judges at all. Uh, next up, we have ISS Spotter, uh, embodying the spot the station challenge. Hello, everybody. My name is Bruce Martinez, and I'm part of the team. So NASA made it possible for any of us to know when the International Space Station is visible above us. We made it more accessible by turning it, by turning it into an experience that we believe everyone will love. So how do we do this? We know the importance of social media these days, and I think that one of the aspects that's missing from what's currently available is the social aspect. And we do this by applying a couple of social uh, APIs that will allow us to distribute this better. And at the same time, we think that we should beautify the experience that currently exists. <clears throat> we do this initially through Foursquare. You know, we allow people to actually check in to the International Space Station. And how does it work? Well, we just to check into the ISS when it's bugging, and we define the radius. So you can't do this when it's somewhere else in the world. We used to really go to alert people when the ISS will be nearby, so you don't have to be watching the clock all the time. Share the experience to Facebook, which is important, and we allow you to actually submit content. So it can be messages, it can be photographs, and we use Aviator to do that. So the yeah, yeah, ISS are implemented over. Uh, Foursquare, the ISS, Twilio, Facebook, and Aviary. And I don't know if you can hear it, but we actually did activate the Twilio API. It should be going off any second. We have a couple of screenshots from what we're working on right now. We're going to go ahead and click through a couple of these so they can actually go ahead and check in. You know, we allow the Foursquare to actually access that data. Once you're cool with that, click that. And you can see more of what we're doing right now. Look at these screens. So this is what's currently up. There's this one model that exists right now for an ISS tracker. And you look at our Foursquare progress so far, and you can tell that it's pretty, pretty darn close. What's it running? We're over water right now. Actually, we're above water, so. But it works. So, going back to our slide. Uh, possible expansions. You know, again, uh, implement more social uh, aspects to the problem to the product. Uh, this is definitely a mobile, uh, mobile application, uh, so we're definitely thinking about mobile. And uh, last but not least, uh, this is our team, and this is our website. Please visit it's one pager app.com International Space Station. And then we have our link to our Twitter page. This is just a 48 hour project. If you guys like it, we'll keep working on this, but we need your input, so we we'll look forward to hearing from you. Uh, 
That's the beauty of it, right? With us, it's whenever it's above us, but they can actually interact with her. So you use another one of our uh, team members. See the um, our team. Uh, for the users, next up, we can actually use um, augmented reality, so the user can turn up his camera and turn up the sky. And based on the position of the satellite, we can show him because it's sometimes it's a bit hard to see it based on the weather. Or the stuff. Um, also, one thing that Commander Hatfield has been big on recently is you know, taking pictures down and posting those right after he takes the picture down. So, would there be a mechanism as well for them to point down the people that click into or tag themselves in pictures that have been taken down at that moment? Yeah, absolutely. We actually started acting a little bit on that direction. Uh, I think that. And I think one of the lines we said originally in our pitch, you know, is about making it more accessible for a better experience. And a lot of that experience relies on social. And that includes the talking about both from our end and from their end. Okay. Um, I am looking forward to checking in on the space station. I don't know about you. Do it. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Renewably, and they embody the challenge for Renewable Energy Explorer. Who's got the mic? Hi, all. We decided to work on the Renewable Energy Explorers project for a couple of major reasons. Number one, um, only a small portion of the electricity that consumers are um, using today in the United States is very low compared to what the total amount of electricity being uh, consumed in the U.S. is. It's about 9.2% renewable right now. And also CO2 emissions are rising as we speak. Um, they're about 22% higher than they were in the 1980s. And so we just really need to start uh, thinking about building green. And so we decided to create this project called Renewably. And Renewably basically just shows um, it's, it's an API that links uh, zip codes to what the current renewable energy index for a particular state is. And so what is the renewable energy index? So we created that based on the current consumption of renewable energy in a particular state versus the total amount of energy in that particular state. And so for instance, um, we built a couple of applications based off this API. For instance, this Google intensity uh, map right here. And for instance, you can just see that for Oregon, it has a much higher index score than, uh, for instance, the state like Texas. And the, the green for Oregon basically represents that Oregon homeowners and uh, electricity users use a much larger proportion of their energy than those in Texas. We also built a mobile application for using this API. And the mobile application will allow you to basically figure out what your renewable energy index score is based on your location. And so, uh, I mean, we hope to use this eventually. We hope to refine the data and set up on a statewide level, eventually into counties and individuals that post to return a more accurate data point. Um, and eventually we can see public, uh, public governments using this as an incentive. Way to advise where to put incentives for renewable energy. Are they here from the Energy Information Administration? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So, the granularity of that data is only at the state level. You couldn't find it at the smaller level, so for that particular visualization. Granularity is available, but it's not all available in one place. So it'll require quite a bit of data mining in the future to obtain that information. But it is available through publicly available resources. It'll just need to, it'll just be a, a long-term effort to sort of gather that and put it into a readable format. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. Uh, next up, we have Cogito Ergo Sum, I think, therefore I am, which embodies the Why We Explore Challenge. Hi, 
Hi, hello everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank NASA to make this happen, and uh, I want to thank Torio to make it. Uh, so, you see the phone number? Just call it now, so that you don't need to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, we try to answer this question: Why we explore? And when I first look at this challenge, I think it's not a question because why we explore is part of our human nature and the reason we are standing here today is because our pioneer way back in the time they do all the hard work and what we are doing today is not for us it's for our children, for our next generation, for the future so uh, I do this because I want one day that my son can step up on Mars or even beyond the solar system um, so, uh, well, so what we did over this weekend is we made a podcast and because we don't have the facility to play the sound here so it's on that phone number, just call it and you will hear the voice from throughout the history and the inspiration for us to do that is because Einstein found that space and time is essentially the same parameter in the beginning of last century so all those information in the past of the time we want to bring it back to now and that's what we did so then just so i'm clear you called the phone number yes. and it returns to you sayings from the past or what is it that is actually what's actually that what do you hear uh, you will hear all the giants from the past, Newton, Einstein, Kepler, who uh, did all the great work, and then it will represent the, there will be music, so the music will represent the time, and to represent the, 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 the environment they're living in. So it's a podcast. Were um, the quotes audible, or did you have to do something to actually? Did you say them, and the, yes. were they already pre-recorded? Pre um, yeah, he was saying. Let's hear your voice. Hello. Um, the uh, audio I did all myself. I did. Um, I did. Uh, straight up improv on it. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with the history of uh, the astronomers and scientists and physicists uh, that contributed to a great amount of where we are today. Um, the podcast basically starts with uh, Copernicus and travels all the way to the moon landing. Uh, if I, I wanted to go to the Voyager, exiting the solar system, but that would have taken like an hour. You'd be sitting on the phone for quite some time, so I decided not to do that. But, um, it's basically a radio transmission, and it, and it weaves in and out with different sound effects, and there's different uh, uh, voices for each character. It's, it's pretty fun, so I think anybody who listens to it will enjoy it, if the sound quality is good. You can play it off the computer from the website, and it's a lot better sound quality. I might want to put on headphones, but um, I don't know, so people enjoy it. How long is the loop? Eight minutes. Uh, is it ten minutes? Eight minutes. Oh, eight minutes. And one thing, I am terribly sorry to Galileo, I forgot about you. <laughs> so. Thank you guys, and I'm just going to actually apologize that we unfortunately don't have the capability with our audio to actually play back stuff from presentation, so that's my bad. Sorry about that guys. Uh, next up is Free Flight NYC, the No Delays Air Traffic Management Challenge. Thank you, sir. Where's my line? So, our presentation is uh, short on visuals and long on code. I think our, our, our output was uh, given a time constraint. It's going to end up being a software design pattern for doing certain kinds of things. Right? So, the Free Flight Challenge was uh, presented as, as, a, as a challenge to kind of to gamify and to express the, the idea of trying out different modes of controlling aircraft and, and, and routing traffic and things like that. Uh, the challenge didn't mention the free flight initiative uh, by name, I don't think, but that's kind of what I read into it. In 1995, uh, the FAA director issued a challenge to uh, issue a directive to figure out how we can have like, less top-down control of how aircraft get to where they're going. Right? So instead of, 
controller saying, you, you know, this aircraft has to take this route to get from this airport to this one. There's local control, the pilot, uh, uh, the pilot in command you know, uses a kind of a, a collection of electronics, GPS, uh, 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 onboard radar, nav aids, and what have you to figure out how to get from point A to point B and to do collision avoidance and all those things in the cockpit. Uh, our, um, so our design pattern, we, uh, our, wait, our teammate who's not here, uh, had the idea to use the Scala language uh, and the actor facility in the Scala language to, to, to build this simulation. So why is that a big deal? Well, uh, you can imagine a simulation like this involves lots of objects doing lots of things simultaneously. If you try to build a simulation like that with top-down control, with someone telling each object what it is uh, it has to do, then pretty soon you have more top-down complexity than you can handle. So the idea behind the, the actor design pattern, which is not original, uh, uh, is that everything, every object in the system is an actor. And an actor is something that can create other actors, it can respond to messages, and it can decide what its behavior is. Right? So, we used uh, the ACA.io framework. Can we just um, pull up the So if you scroll down a bit, scroll down and then, yeah, scroll down this way. Thank you, sir. So, you know, the, the, the basic kind of hello world actor in uh, ACA code in Scala involves you know, creating some kind of object uh, and passing in a message saying, okay, I greet you object, and the object responds, oh, Okay, so very quickly back to the, back to the um, so we found that we can do this. We have we can create a, a, a behavior map so that the, 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 the switch case state, the thing that says if you get this message, do this. If you get a client message, do that. We can externalize that, and we can add behaviors. Scroll down, please. Uh, and we can add behaviors to an object. Software engineer, so I'd like to see both of them on the screen. Uh, that, that looked really awesome. I mean, and the more we can see of real world solutions, the better. So, thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Roy Hopper uh, embodying the Exploring Asteroids Planet Hopper Challenge.
and yeah, we just do that for part of our fun. So but, to add to that, the, the lead motion controller we program to be able to uh, we program to be able to zoom around uh, the, the solar system, and also and also to be able to zoom with uh, two hands so that you can use minority style minority board style gestures to uh, zoom in and out, and you could really build anything on top of this. The click on the asteroids, maybe last of them, shoot them at other planets. <laughs>
unfortunately, there's no central place for or ordinances uh, regarding laws about having chickens. So we want to use MongoDB, set up a database uh, for places to actually record all the different laws related to can I have chickens in my backyard. Um, we also thought that using something like Foursquare to gamify the connection of backyard farmers to other people, other events, would be a good idea. And integration of a tool like Talkbox, right, where I can show you my group from my house just using a handheld device would be um, a great way to share information and connect people. What about some sort of function if you have excess eggs and someone needs eggs? Sounds good. <laughs> Did you look at any other types of farms besides chickens, or did you look at uh, planting um, um, vegetables or crops or anything? I, I think uh, well, we really wanted to focus on poultry in general, but we just picked chickens for now. But the, we would future, in the future expand, but that's another idea as well. I think the other part of the idea is that chickens are, as far as meat goes, they're the um, most efficient uh, converters of energy. So a chicken can produce about a pound two pounds of food, whereas a cow takes more like five to ten. So it's about efficiency of conversion whenever you're climbing up the uh, food ladder. Thank you guys. That's a, a great presentation. I know in New York especially, I think a lot of people would like to use that product now that we can raise chickens in the city. Uh, next up, we have uh, actually a group of high school students who came here to work this weekend. Uh, Pathways of Technology Early College High School. Um, these guys were really impressive. They, they, uh, a lot of people who saw them working were really, uh, really quite impressed what they did. So they're doing Lovely Blue, which embodies the Blue Marble Challenge. Um, before I begin, I want to tell you guys if he didn't say I was a high schooler, would you know? <laughs> um, okay, so I'm a 10th grader at P Tech High School, and um, me and a group of peers decided to take on the big the blue market challenge. We call it the Levy Blue. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> so, the goal of the application was to create a platform a website that consolidates a goal, a uh, collection of space imagery, and makes it more ac accessible to people. Um, and so what we used were, was Sinatra, and we had a whole bunch of JSON in a text file, and Twitter Blue Chat, because we were not web designers. We suck at that. <laughs> so, yeah, that was really sad, because, I mean, we would have really loved a beautiful layout for this, but we don't have one. And so a lot of work, more work was put into the back end, trying to parse the JSON, and actually give these images to you guys. And so now I guess I'll demo it. Yeah. Okay, edit. Alright, there you go. So we also try to incorporate the 
Avery API to edit the photos that you find. Um, refresh the page, please. Sorry for the technical difficulties. All right, so yeah, you're able to edit the photos from here, and hopefully, if nothing breaks, you can save it too. And that's pretty much it. So when you edit a, a photo and you save it, it saves it as a copy of the original photo? Yes, you should get a link. Yeah, so you should get a link and then from there on that it saves your desktop. Were you going to integrate it with any social um, channels or was it a separate registration? Um, yeah, I'll, well the plan was to extend it to be able to save it, to face, um, share it on Facebook and Twitter using your APIs. Is there a plan uh, in the future to tie it to a map so uh, if the pictures from a specific area up there? Or in some way organize the pictures to a Um Well, that, yeah, that, that sure would go into the layer, the development process there. Yeah. One more thing, um, if you would like, we're doing a fundraiser to sell buttons. <laughs> I'm not sure if, I'm sure most of you have maybe bought them, but um, donations start at dollars for a pin. Uh, yeah, so feel free to donate. Awesome, thank you guys. Definitely a worthy donation to make there. Um, so we're just going to take a short break. Uh, we're going to switch out uh, to bring in another judge and have a little confab with the judges. And uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. And we'll try and catch up a little bit to our presentation schedule. Everybody, welcome back to Space Apps NYC. Um, thank you. Thank you. So uh, we saw a really amazing and impressive round of uh, our first 10 uh, uh, challenge uh, presenters, and we're about to go into the second half, the next 10. Uh, we have added a judge to our lineup, so we now have four judges. Uh, I'd like to welcome Liz Berry. Uh, Liz is with the Public Laboratory for Open Technology and Science. Uh, grassroots self-starting citizen science data visualization group. She actually very graciously came uh, to our uh, pre-event uh, on uh, data, si data visualization and citizen science. Uh, and we're very excited to have her here to add to the, the rest of our judges' perspective. Uh, so uh, without further ado, um, I'm actually going to, where did my phone go? Oop. What's the next? Uh, Breathe. <laughs> Breathe. That wasn't a command. That was actually true. Uh, so, what's do you, what's the challenge uh, they represent? The Earth Day. Earth Day. So next we have Breathe, who is representing the Earth Day challenge. Hi, my name is Andrew Leung, and I have to say, Ron's speech on Friday night really inspired me, and it really helped set me up for this challenge. Basically, you said that we have all the technology in the world right now to solve whatever complex problems we have. And I just like to look back and see we have done some amazing things so far. So Breathe is basically we looked at the Earth Day Challenge and we saw how the EPA has helped make our lives better and how a specific city is being able to breathe easier. Does anyone know this skyline? It's Los Angeles, right? Has anyone been to Los Angeles? It's fantastic, right? Except for what? Traffic. Well, let's try, okay, let's skip to, let's skip to the smog. So we have the smog. This was in the 50s. People were actually selling air for 50 cents in the 50s. It's almost like four bucks today, right? In today's dollars. They were selling that fresh desert air. And how do we, this is from the 50s, but this is LA now. How do we get from 
this to this. And basically, it's through improvements of technology in cars and also improvements with legislation, working with these car manufacturers and improving the whole system at once. Now, when we looked at the EPA data, this is the carbon monoxide readings from Los Angeles for the last 30 years, every single day. If you notice, there's a huge peak coming down. And basically, carbon monoxide has been decreasing for the last 30 years because car technology has become better. But if you notice in the small level, levels, these peaks, the cars are still, there's still just as many cars and we're still going through a cycle. And that's why we're, a city is breathing to us. Now, we have, a, our, we have a demo of a web app, so where we show all this technology and how these legislations come about. And if you have time, please check it out. We used a lot of tech, um, a lot of it was D3, and we had a lot of fun. Thank you. So if, if we were to go to the site, what would we see? Can you give us some examples of uh, some of the visualizations? Well, some of the, most of the visual content on there right now is about which years were laws passed and which years like major boards came into play, you know, when the EPA came into formation, the California Resource Board for Air Quality Control. So we, do, we are you know, slowly building out the content, but you know, that information is important to remember that we have solved huge complex problems already and we can bring this into the future as well. And we should not forget you know, no challenge is insurmountable. Thanks very much. Next up, we have the versioning goat, uh, embodying the sinking NASA open source uh, projects challenge. The versioning goat. Yes. So uh, we set out to take on the most boring looking challenge we could find, um, on the face of it at least, um, which is syncing NASA code repositories. Um, the problem is that NASA has code kind of like all over the place. There's some on SourceForge, there's some on GitHub, uh, there's, it's, it's all over. Um, so we just set out to build something that syncs everything to GitHub basically, which is the task. Uh, that's our logo. I'd like to thank Sarah and the audience for pulling it together. Um, it shows a goat consuming archive files, which are kind of like the junk that goats eat, and then excreting a beautiful GitHub repository, um, which is what the app does. Uh, it's, it's a back-end thing, so that, you know, this is the only way we can really visualize it, a logo. Um, all right, and uh, so, yeah, let's just walk through really quickly. Um, it's syncing a repository. Uh, that's what's, it's pulling in a repository from SourceForge uh, right now, and uh, there it is. It created a GitHub repo uh, using GitHub API, and uh, yeah, we also have a, a little bit of, a, we monitor SourceForge uh, for updates using their, uh, using SendGrid, because they send out email updates, so we get a little, uh, yeah, well, that, well, there's that. Anyway, the bottom line is uh, we pull stuff into GitHub. Thank you. Just how much was there in SourceForge versus GitHub that you had to pull over? Like, did you choose GitHub because it's easier to put things in GitHub, or was there less in SourceForge? The challenge specified GitHub as kind of the, the best most desirable place. Um, and most of the NASA code stuff already is there, so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So, again, as a software engineer, this is something that I'm very excited about seeing. So next up, we have the awesome asteroid mapper. It's one of our hardware challenges. Uh, and this will be embodying the CubeSats for asteroid exploration. Thank you. 
Hey guys, I'm going to go through this pretty quick because we had a lot of people involved in our challenge and that actually turned out to be one of the best things about our challenge. Uh, the Alvos brought their, brought their, their young kids and uh, yeah, so he wrote, he wrote some of his, his, uh, his first code today. We had somebody from so many different teams collaborate and, uh, and we ended up breaking up into, into several different teams that did some amazing stuff. So I want to, well, we're going through this really quick. So uh, what we built is a theoretical terrestrial prototype of an asteroid mapper that we would build into a CubeSat. Um, the slides that are going by really quickly because we want to get to the demo are showing some of the work that was done. We had a couple people who uh, built custom avionics. We had people dedicated to writing the mathematics necessary to do this. We had people building Arduino sensors. That was a, a, a three-dimensional uh, exported map that you could take and print an STL file using Shapeways so that young people can get physical asteroids uh, printed in their living rooms uh, when, when we send one out to the, to the next day. I'm not in sync. Don't even, don't pay attention to that. Uh, so, uh, so what I would like to do is, is uh, show you guys how this thing works. On that display is a real-time three-dimensional map that's being built by the ultrasonic sensor that is uh, uh, pinging out from that craft. It is uh, going to operate autonomously. Uh, it is in your best interest to assume a defensive posture. <laughs> I will say that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's give it a shot. Okay. Oh, great. You guys are brave. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll protect the judges. <laughs> If it doesn't work, I get points for, for bravery. There we go. All right. Watch on the screen. And forward flight. Yeah, so now we're going forward, and you can see that it's mapping what you see on this screen. And so that's the demo. Uh, yep. <laughs> so there we go. And that was, that's autonomous. Somebody wrote avionics software for that thing. It's crazy. I would like to show what a high resolution uh, sensor is because ultrasonic is low resolution. So if you can look there, you can see these guys have a connect. That's a better example whoa, of something that would actually work in space. Uh, so you can see they're building a three dimensional point cloud. This gentleman over here is going to show you how we can control this thing with a, uh, a, a leap motion sensor. So we have so much science and so much code and so much engineering going into this thing and it's a collaboration of a lot of different teams and this is exactly what this kind of thing is about. Uh, and maybe, perhaps, not <laughs> anticlimactic. Anyway, it's off. That's Oh, clap off, clap off, sad man, yeah. <laughs> all right, that's okay. We, we were ambitious in trying to get all this stuff in, but I think we got the point across. Uh, please don't cut me in the back of my neck with it while I'm <laughs> addressing the judges. So. There you go. Can, can you? Sorry. And this is the most dangerous part. Oh! Oh! Building a three-dimensional point cloud. It 
It's not terribly high resolution because the processor on board that Arduino is not super powerful. But you can see as he approaches the objects, the point cloud gets closer and closer to him. Yeah, you see now that's a really close object that he just got. So we use an ultrasonic sensor, which obviously won't work in space because there's no air for sound waves to travel through, but it's very easy to program, so we used it here. But in a space version, you would use something like a kinetic hammer with a point cloud, you would use lasers that, uh, that those two physicists happened to have in their lab and offered to let us use, but we couldn't figure out how to fit a power supply onto a quadrocopter. Um, and so this turned out to be like one of the most exciting weekends of coding I have ever had, and it was because of my incredibly brilliant team. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I can't thank these guys enough for the work that they, they did. I did not think this was possible when we started. So, so last yeah. question, what's next? How do you take that? What do you want that to be? What's next is a couple things. One, the avionics that were written for that would be applicable in a real cube satellite if you did something like use an electrostatic propulsion uh, unit to change the orientation of this thing in space. The other cool thing we could do is take the center out of that thing, uh, make a three-dimensional gimbal, put like, an actual CubeSat in there, and detect the amount of propulsion that's uh, coming out of the CubeSat so that we could make a CubeSat that would behave the way it would in space. And you can think about the number of science experiments that can't be properly tested terrestrially because we don't have microgravity, or at least we can't sustain microgravity for a very long time here. Using something like a quadricopter <coughs> would allow us to simulate microgravity and perform these tests uh, uh, terrestrially, and the, the incredible amount of science that could then be done because of the things that you're able to test here on Earth would expand exponentially. So, there it is. Presenter up is this star map sculpture, which is embodying. For the, the 3D printing challenge. Yes, so um, what we did basically was um, use data from Astro Nexus, um, which gave us uh, data of a bunch of stars and uh, map of stars, and we then turned that into an application which allowed us to um, print that and then uh, 3D print that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm nervous. Okay, so basically our first um, rendition of it um, was something like this. Um, and all we have is a few stairs held up by a stick. And then, you know, we sort of thought about it, and then we got the second block looking thing. And what it actually represents to us is uh, NASA's ambitions, um, closing the gap between us and what we know about space out know, there. And you don't see any uh, space between the stars here? Yeah. Okay, we can go. Um, so the suggestion we got from the challenge stage was to use um, Gaia, the Gaia mission from the ESA. Um, yeah, from the ESA. Um, and the Gaia mission basically would be sent to space and a um, map of over a billion stars uh, in our galaxy and in other galaxies. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, and then we moved on to the, and we use this database, which is a 100,000 stars database by. Um, Google Maps. Um, yeah, this is how we did it. We used Python and um, we used Python and Excel and etc. Uh, and um, our next step, we actually wanted to build an application that would interface with um, Shapeways, so um, users or public can actually build their own neighborhood of stars. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to make everyone NASA Shapeway for this.
Hi, everybody. I'm Robert. Um, that model that we're looking at, we were staking each, well, those are my favorite, of course, but we did do the one up here, which is actually solved. So we took uh, each star and drew a sphere so that it would intersect with its nearest neighbor. And it has a couple of nice benefits. And primarily, uh, apart from the whole philosophical side of it, it makes a printable sculpture. So the, the ball and stick one, again, you're holding something in three space, you have to have it touch the ground plane or touch something else that touches the ground plane, or it doesn't become printable. So in this case, when we uh, filled the space so that the stars would intersect one another, they inherently became a convex manifold surface, and then we could print it. And uh, the assumption, so far what we've seen, is that each one will look slightly different, so it will be unique. So you can create the big uh, uh, narrative, or you can create the process. Um, Hi, I'm Jason. 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 I'm
Yeah. And look at the like look at the satellite. Yeah, watch out, um, Edwin. You're blocking the projector. So this is a sample of Mars 3D environment, and we have Curiosity there. We have Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. We used Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter data to make a texture for the ground, and we also included the Viking uh, probe, which was there, and. But, but the idea here is that since not everybody can go to Mars, since Curiosity is there and you want to experience it at home, that you could use a device like this which immerses you in an environment and you could experience Mars without being there. Because Mars is very cold, so you'd be literally chilling. <laughs> Instead of figuratively chilling. I think we're good. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions for the judges? Questions? How extensive was the area that you involved? It was the landing site for Curiosity, I believe. So the texture that we chose in the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, when Curiosity landed on Mars, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was basically making sure that Curiosity landed in the, same, in the right spot. So we, we centered the Curiosity model on this map with Curiosity for where it landed. So. And that data is freely available on the high-rise map. So. Well, one thing we want to emphasize is that NASA has tons of data for like lunar, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, underwater, um, Titan, where, wherever it is coming from. In a very accessible and affordable way, you can take this data and then create an immersive environment that you can explore. And it's not just like physical environments. Like you can explore a galaxy, a nebula, a cluster. That is the, it's not just going to Mars. Um, does that uh, device, the Oculus device, have the ability to also enter like you affecting the game environment? If you were to pick something up in your immersive environment, is that possible or is that not have that, that right now? So at the moment it's just for visual and you use like a keyboard to interact with whatever program you're using. But that's up to come. This is brand new. I I back this project and mine hasn't been shipped yet. It's three hundred dollars by the way, at Oculus Rift. And but that'll come. But the point of it is to immerse you in something. So you really feel like you're there. I know you guys can try it, but um, maybe later we can make some demos and show you more of it. Using Unity is a great touch. Um, is the Oculus Rift going to be open source hardware? So, um, right now Oculus has a, a Unity plugin because it has to segment the display and it has to do camera tricks in order for this to work. Um, but they are already plugins, I don't think they're out yet. Because Unity is a paid program. Um, I think they're coming out with plugins for open source free modeling and blender. Yes, and I do want to mention we can build it in Blender and then just put it into Unity because that was the only one that had a plugin. I'd like to make a quick note. Everybody, uh, John Oquist is over there. Raise your hand, John. John was a participant in last year's Space Apps Challenge, came back this year. He was actually on one of the, the, the globally nominated teams from New York last year. Congrats, John. So next we have uh, Interactive Weather Map, uh, an educational game tool. And uh, this is embodying the Earth from Space Challenge. I like to have my team to be here just to introduce them. Who are they? Who are in my team? Excuse me? Oh, stand here. Oh, thanks. Uh, David and Aditya. It's a team collaboration, so everything should be credited for what we have done. And then I would like to thank NASA and the community for giving us the opportunity to work on an exciting, innovative project, community-based project, and to serve the community. So, can you go to the next turn? Everybody 
still watches TV, even though TV subscription is going down, but still people watch TV. And everybody wonders, how do this weatherman person come up with predictions of the weather? It's like almost like a rocket science. So we looked into the NOAA reach database and see whether we can change the rocket science into people to understand and read the weather map and can predict the weather map on their own. So our goal is to teach kids how to read and interpret the weather map like a pro using the, using the education game product that we developed based on the NOAA database and the images. So what kind of demography we are addressing? Basically, the preteens, K2, not K, to grade two to grade six, and then the teens. But the team will be the phase two project. So next chart, please. Okay, so I did give you what are these goals for different stages. So for phase one, this is our deliverable for today. So we try to address providing an interactive weather map game interface on the portal for the age seven to 12. And then later on, our target is both pre-teens as well as teens with a very complex uh -huh, interfaces. Not interfaces, but very robust images using robust weather map images from NOAA. So, um, and then these are our target goals for the surface too. Uh, and how to also credit the kids when they do excellent jobs. So let's go to the, oh, I would like to also mention here, I provided, can you go back to the location-based and localization interface support in the second phase? And the reason is that three of us speak more than seven languages, including English. So we have a lot of understanding of the global culture. So we want to make it a globally reachable game with a localization feature. So that's our next step. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I didn't even show the demos. OK, please, please, show the demo, please. Yeah. So the demo for this. So you can see the demo here is the pressure map. So the kids are asked to identify how they're going to go from different ISO, ISO bars. So they get the concepts of how to define what is an ISO bar. So for temperature to the isotherms. So they will do that and then show the next one. So you can see now they understand what is a low pressure and high pressure regions but through this game portal. So the next one, let's go to the next one. This is for pre, like next phase for the older kids. So you can see how rich is the uh, interface now. Uh, and this is from NOAA databases. We use some of their APIs. So you can see now the looking at that and looking at the standards from the weather map that the health portal will provide. They can identify what are the based on those color. Those are the standard colors from the weather, weather standards. They can identify what are the degrees. Any questions? Thank you. Can you um, describe again on the last page when you entered the three data points, what it is that they were trying to get out of the three data points? That just wasn't clear to me. Can you go back to the, the uh, image? Not this one. The yeah, next yeah, next yeah, the next one. The, the colorful one. The color one. Oh. See, they have all these colors. <laughs> to us, it's a rocket science today. Then we provide the portal, help portal, as well as provide some indications if you see on the bottom what each color means based on the weather standards. They will predict, yeah, understanding the standards that are used, the standards C 
symbol standards, color standards, different standards they were used. And then they predict, based on those standards, what are the temperatures. So it's just one example. It could be pressure, it could be dew points. So we'll be presenting uh, the second challenge by the same team. Okay, we also have a second project. Uh, in the uh, art from space. Uh, no, no, this, we didn't have the presentation, just the photo. So what we did was like looking at the ISS on the KLM images. So we said, okay, so the students will provide a portal for, we didn't have the time to upload the image. So we use this image. So ask the kids, can you guess the location where it is? Or can you guess what it is on, on the ISS pictures? And then they will come up with an answer. So then we we'll go and check it out. Sorry, you're wrong. The exact location is below. What we did was like take that picture and now we'll put it on the Google Art. So they get the answers. So they get both feel like what it is. Uh, and then I remember when you're presenting, I was wondering what are those? Can tell. So I tried to guess. So with the book, with uploading on the Google Art, then I can see what are really happening. So basically, trying to increase the inclusiveness uh, in the students. Next up, I would like to have Go Rover uh, embodying the Lego Rovers Challenge. Hi everyone, my name is Angela and that's my partner Caroline and we have our Go Rover right there on the desk. And um, so, And uh, our project is called Go Rover because we were um, on Saturday morning. We were thinking of the ro uh, the Lego Rover challenge, but the most difficult part was we don't have Legos. So our project is Go Rover now. <laughs> so we built it with a uh, um, aim that we want our rover to have the basic features of a car, like turn right and left, so it would be able to explore the environment saying, you know, on another planet. And then we would let it carry an iPhone and then it would wirelessly send the image to our laptop. That way we would know the surrounding and be able to operate the rover saying it you know, in, on another planet. And then in the future we were thinking of adding other sensors to the rover. And then you know, during the um, challenge, uh, we built this, and it's still in progress because we couldn't get it to work with wireless for now, and we couldn't, you know, connect some of the parts because it was difficult. And yeah, and but I think the most interesting part is the materials that we use, which is a lot of them are very like common material. We use toy cars, we use like coffee stir sticks, um, and olive oil, um, and thank you for ordering like salad. <laughs> <laughs> and we use like soap in the bathroom just to try to get the hardware working, and I think that's the most challenging part with hardware. We don't know what's wrong, maybe it's because it's you know, dirty or something. We borrowed lighter and we borrowed a lot of uh, hardware from the awesome uh, asteroid people. The work that was the flying project, so they lent us there a lot of cool things, but we haven't been using them a lot yet. So we both want to thank people for borrowing, like for lending us things. We want to show. Uh, yeah, we have a like three second of you 
YouTube video. This is going to just be having, getting it to move forward and getting it to control the speed with a simple program. It's a Awesome. I mean, that's collaboration and hacking all rolled into one. That's really great. Good job, guys. Okay, so next up, we only have two more left. Uh, so this one I mentioned earlier that some of our ABR sponsors got very excited. Uh, here we have Anker from Talkbox, and uh, they worked on the Tiny Seabots uh, project for the Open ROV Challenge. low-cost underwater robot that can explore the sea um, and we made it work over the internet so kids, parents, all people <laughs> can um, uh, access it and explore the sea so does it work? This is live. So this is live right now. This is in San Francisco. Um, when it starts exploring we got uh, one of our robots in San Francisco that we can connect to, which is the one you just saw over today. Um, and the interface we chose here to control it is actually actually the coolest part of what we did. Uh, we use one of the leap motion sensors, which is just a gesture sensor in midair, and uh, it should be able to control our um, open ROV. Yeah. So I'm going to start this up. I'll show this. And yeah, it's, it's pretty tight. <laughs> Sorry, the screen's smaller than we expected. You have to be in the front. No, it's working. Okay. See the left arrow is going on and off. It's because I'm waving my hand to the left. And you should be able to see some of those um, pieces of paper over the motors move. So we wanted to get this underwater, but uh, the facilities didn't allow us to do that. So uh, we did the best we could. and. Uh, there's also the other one. Yeah, we're seeing a video. Okay. Are you guys that means it's moving? <laughs> <laughs> you should trust them. <laughs> Is it moving for you guys? Yes, it's very tight. What else? Just before you guys start, I'll send out the wall on the seven person in here. Oh. It sounds like it was moving. Oh. Yeah, that's the, the rudders. That's what it sounds like, yes. <laughs> so it does work. <laughs> um, but we're making it so anyone can register their open RV around the world, and then anyone can use an RV around the world, anywhere around the world as well. So you can explore the sea coming up home. <laughs> So you can access those from the internet. 
So before you couldn't access that on the internet, you can only access it locally when you're right next to it. So now anyone could put their open ROV and make it open to the world. Um, so anyone can support it. Yes. Did you think about social integration? So when people actually log on and register and want to use it, that they link up with their Facebook site or they can check in their ROV at different parts? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like we wanted to take pictures and you can share that or maybe even crowdsource certain explorations. Like maybe someone sees something that no one's ever seen before and um, you can take a snapshot. That'd be pretty cool. Okay, so we've reached the, uh, the end of our presentations. We have our final entrance, a uh, original challenge, uh, not particularly tied to any uh, of the uh, SpaceX challenge. Uh, uh, I'm told that uh, this uh, project is called Monstro. to address one, one problem, which is to how do you, how do you sustain the inspiration uh, and inspire, continue to inspire kids to reach for the stars and you know, uh, to, uh, to become inspired by making rockets and you know, going to space. And um, we, we thought that you know, when we were growing up, uh, we didn't have the tools that we have right now. I mean, who doesn't want to go to space here? Everyone wants to, but we don't have the means. So uh, how, how, do you, how do you make it possible to 
uh, have people, have kids collaborate with exports? And you know, uh, how do you make that, you know, create an online community to, to make that possible? So uh, we, uh, we decided to build uh, this prototype for Make a Rocket Foundation. And uh, so the idea, you know, the idea, idea is that rocket science is hard. And uh, it doesn't have to be. Uh, I think part of the problem is just you know, the way that it's explained. It's, uh, it gets really complicated. And uh, we were inspired by this, uh, this comic, uh, XKCD comic. Um, he, you know, he made a comic where he explained uh, a blueprint, blueprint of a rocket ship. Uh, using only the only thousand, thousand most commonly wor used words uh, to explain it to a kid. So I thought uh, that was really inspiring, and I think that it could be done like this uh, to and you know, to to inspire kids to, uh, to create projects that can actually become rockets. And you know you can uh, you can build rockets, prototype them uh, using 3D printers, and you know Shapeways Shapeways API is great for that. So we wanted to first of all invent a process for uh, you know collaborating, uh, and then to uh, to you know ensure that everything is all in place. And so we built this uh, website that's at makerocket.heroquap.com. You can actually go there and check it out. So we have uh, we are still working on the process of how people would uh, would work through this. You know, go through the inspiration, ideation, prototyping, and lift up uh, thesis. And you can actually go here and become an Imagineer, uh, upload, uh, upload, uh, you know, enter your name, uh, find your blueprint, upload it, and and then you know, lift up. There's a gallery of uh, gallery that I started. You know, this is uh, you know, this is a rocket with a story. I think every kid has a story that uh, they can tell about a rocket. So if, they, if we can just you know start aggregating these stories and the, the drawings of the rocket ships, then we can uh, you know get people, builders, makers to come on on the site and uh, collaborate and talk to the kids and help them through the process of uh, building and pursuing their dreams. that uh, allows us to import uh, the, um, the, the projects that uh, users uh, create. So if you actually um, go on this site and um, you know, become a maker, you sign up as a maker, we uh, take your uh, Shapeways handle, uh, we'll look at it, and then uh, once one, you come uh, as a registered user, and you can import your uh, creations and associate them with a project that rocket. it.